Section 25 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On Affairs in America. By William Pitt, Earl of Chatham. On Affairs in America. Footnote. Spoken in the House of Lords, November 18, 1777. A report of this speech was corrected by Chatham himself, and its publication authorized by him. It has usually been accepted as his greatest oration. He was then in his seventieth year. In spite of his efforts, the amendment proposed by him was lost by a vote of ninety-seven to twenty-four. Parliament then adjourned, and the alliance between France and America, which made certain the triumph of the colonies, became an accomplished fact. Chatham's last appearance in Parliament was made a few months after this speech, on April 7, 1778, when he protested against the acknowledgment of American independence because it would dismember the British Empire. End footnote. 1777. I rise, my lords, to declare my sentiments on this most solemn and serious subject. It has imposed a load upon my mind which I fear nothing can remove but which impels me to endeavor its alleviation by a free and unreserved communication of my sentiments. In the first part of the address I have the honor of heartily concurring with the noble Earl who moved it. No man feels sincerer joy than I do. None can offer more genuine congratulations on every accession of strength to the Protestant succession. I therefore join in every congratulation on the birth of another princess, and the happy recovery of Her Majesty. But I must stop here. My courtly complaisance will carry me no farther. I will not join in congratulation on misfortune and disgrace. I cannot concur in a blind and servile address which approves and endeavors to sanctify the monstrous measures which have heaped disgrace and misfortune upon us. This, my lords, is a perilous and tremendous moment. It is not a time for adulation. The smoothness of flattery cannot now avail cannot save us in this rugged and awful crisis. It is now necessary to instruct the throne in the language of truth. We must dispel the illusion and the darkness which envelop it and display, in its full danger and true colors, the ruin that is brought to our doors. This, my lords, is our duty. It is the proper function of this noble assembly, sitting as we do, upon our honors in this house, the hereditary council of the crown. Who is the minister? Where is the minister that has dared to suggest to the throne the contrary unconstitutional language this day delivered from it? The accustomed language from the throne has been application to Parliament for advice, and a reliance on its constitutional advice and assistance. As it is the right of Parliament to give, so it is the duty of the Crown to ask it. But on this day, and in this extreme momentous exigency, no reliance is reposed on our constitutional councils. No advice is asked from the sober and enlightened care of Parliament. But the Crown, from itself and by itself, declares an unalterable determination to pursue measures. And what measures, my lords? The measures that have produced the imminent perils that threaten us. The measures that have brought ruin to our doors. Can the minister of the day now presume to expect a continuance of support in this ruinous infatuation? Can Parliament be so dead to its dignity and its duty as to be thus deluded into the loss of the one and the violation of the other? To give an unlimited credit and support for the steady perseverance in measures not proposed for our parliamentary advice, but dictated and forced upon us, in measures, I say, my lords, which have reduced this late flourishing empire to ruin and contempt. But yesterday in England might have stood against the world. Now none so poor to do her reverence. Footnote. News had just reached England of the defeat of Burgoyne at Saratoga. End footnote. I use the words of a poet, but though it be poetry it is no fiction. It is a shameful truth that not only the power and strength of this country are wasting away and expiring, but her well-earned glories, her true honor and substantial dignity are sacrificed. France, my lords, has insulted you. She has encouraged and sustained America. 
and whether america be wrong or right the dignity of this country ought to spurn at the officious insult of french interference the ministers and ambassadors of those who are called rebels and enemies are in paris footnote franklin dean and lee are here referred to End footnote. in paris they transact the reciprocal interest of america and france can there be a more mortifying insult can even our ministers sustain a more humiliating disgrace do they dare to resent it do they presume even to hint a vindication of their honor and the dignity of the state by requiring the dismission of the plenipotentiaries of america such is the degradation to which they have reduced the glories of england the people whom they affect to call contemptible rebels but whose growing power has at last obtained the name of enemies the people with whom they have engaged this country in war and against whom they now command our implicit support in every measure of desperate hostility this people despised as rebels or acknowledged as enemies are abetted against you supplied with every military store their interests consulted and their ambassadors entertained by your inveterate enemy and our ministers dare not interpose with dignity or effect is this the honor of a great kingdom is this the indignant spirit of england who but yesterday gave law to the house of bourbon my lords the dignity of nations demands a decisive conduct in a situation like this even when the greatest prince that perhaps this country ever saw filled our throne the requisition of a spanish general on a similar subject was attended to and complied with for on the spirited remonstrance of the duke of alba elizabeth found herself obliged to deny the flemish exiles all countenance support or even entrance into her dominions and the count lamarck with his few desperate followers were expelled from the kingdom happening to arrive at the brill and finding it weak in defence they made themselves masters of the place and this was the foundation of the united provinces my lords this ruinous and ignominious situation where we cannot act with success nor suffer with honor calls upon us to remonstrate in the strongest and loudest language of truth to rescue the ear of majesty from the delusions which surround it the desperate state of our arms abroad is in part known no man thinks more highly of them than i do i love and honor the english troops i know their virtues and their valor i know they can achieve anything except impossibilities and i know that the conquest of english america is an impossibility you cannot i venture to say it you cannot conquer america your armies in the last war effected everything that could be effected and what was it it cost a numerous army under the command of a most able general lord amherst now a noble lord in this house a long and laborious campaign to expel five thousand frenchmen from french america my lords you cannot conquer america what is your present situation there we do not know the worst but we know that in three campaigns we have done nothing and suffered much besides the suffering perhaps total loss of the northern force the best appointed army that ever took the field commanded by sir william howe has retired from the american lines footnote in the burgoyne campaign general howe who had been expected to proceed up the hudson from new york city and join burgoyne near albany went instead to philadelphia through a blunder made in london he had failed to receive his instructions to join burgoyne End footnote. he was obliged to relinquish his attempt and with great delay and danger to adopt a new and distant plan of operations we shall soon know and in any event have reason to lament what may have happened since as to conquest therefore my lords i repeat it is impossible you may swell every expense and every effort still more extravagantly pile and accumulate every assistance you can buy or borrow traffic and barter with every little pitiful german prince that sells and sends his subjects to the shambles of a foreign prince your efforts are forever vain and impotent doubly so from this mercenary aid on which you rely for it irritates to an incurable resentment the minds of your enemies to overrun them with the mercenary sons of rapine and plunder devoting them and their possessions to the rapacity of hireling cruelty if i were an american as i am an englishman while a foreign troop was landed in my country i would never lay down my arms 
Never, never, never. Your own army is infected with the contagion of these illiberal allies. The spirit of plunder and of rapine is gone forth among them. I know it. And, notwithstanding what the noble Earl, Lord Percy, who moved the address, has given as his opinion of the American army, I know from authentic information and the most experienced officers that our discipline is deeply wounded. While this is notoriously our sinking situation, America grows and nourishes. While our strength and discipline are lowered, hers are rising and improving. But, my lords, who is the man that, in addition to these disgraces and mischiefs of our army, has dared to authorize and associate to our arms the tomahawk and scalping knife of the savage, to call into civilized alliance the wild and inhuman savage of the woods, to delegate to the merciless Indian the defense of disputed rights, and to wage the horrors of his barbarous war against our brethren. Footnote. Lord George Germain of the Ministry is here referred to. See in volume eight of these orations the speeches made to him in London by Joseph Brandt in 1776. Burgoyne came down from Canada with Indians in his service, and St. Ledger came from Lake Ontario with others. At the Battle of Oriskany, Indians were prominent under Joseph Brandt. From that time dates the period of border wars on the frontier of New York. In footnote. My lords, these enormities cry aloud for redress and punishment. Unless thoroughly done away, it will be a stain on the national character. It is a violation of the Constitution. I believe it is against law. It is not the least of our national misfortunes that the strength and character of our army are thus impaired. Infected with the mercenary spirit of robbery and rapine, familiarized to the horrid scenes of savage cruelty, it can no longer boast of the noble and generous principles which dignify a soldier, no longer sympathize with the dignity of the royal banner, nor feel the pride, pomp, and circumstance of glorious war that makes ambition virtue. What makes ambition virtue? The sense of honor. But is the sense of honor consistent with a spirit of plunder, or the practice of murder? Can it flow from mercenary motives, or can it prompt to cruel deeds? Besides these murderers and plunderers, let me ask our ministers, what other allies have they acquired? What other powers have they associated in their cause? Have they entered into alliance with the king of the gypsies? Nothing, my lords, is too low or too ludicrous to be consistent with their counsels. The independent views of America have been stated and asserted as the foundation of this address. My lords, no man wishes for the due dependence of America on this country more than I do. To preserve it, and not confirm that state of independence into which your measures hitherto have driven them, is the object which we ought to unite in attaining. The Americans, contending for their rights against arbitrary exactions, I love and admire. It is the struggle of free and virtuous patriots. But contending for independency and total disconnection from England, as an Englishman, I cannot wish them success. For in a due constitutional dependency, including the ancient supremacy of this country in regulating their commerce and navigation, consists the mutual happiness and prosperity both of England and America. She derived assistance and protection from us, and we reaped from her the most important advantages. She was indeed the fountain of our wealth, the nerve of our strength, the nursery and basis of our naval power. It is our duty, therefore, my lords, if we wish to save our country, most seriously to endeavor the recovery of these most beneficial subjects. And in this perilous crisis, perhaps the present moment may be the only one in which we can hope for success. For in their negotiations with France they have, or think they have, reason to complain, though it be notorious that they have received from that power important supplies and assistance of various kinds, yet it is certain they expected it in a more decisive and immediate degree. America is in ill humor with France. On some points they have not entirely answered her expectations. Let us wisely take advantage of every possible moment of reconciliation. Besides the natural disposition of America herself still leans toward England, to the old habits of connection and mutual interest that united both countries. This was the established sentiment of all the continent. 
and still my lords in the great and principal part the sound part of america this wise and affectionate disposition prevails and there is a very considerable part of america yet sound the middle and the southern provinces some parts may be factious and blind to their true interests but if we express a wise and benevolent disposition to communicate with them those immutable rights of nature and those constitutional liberties to which they are equally entitled with ourselves by a conduct so just and humane we shall confirm the favorable and conciliate the adverse i say my lords the rights and liberties to which they are equally entitled with ourselves but no more i would participate to them every enjoyment and freedom which the colonizing subjects of a free state can possess or wish to possess and i do not see why they should not enjoy every fundamental right in their property and every original substantial liberty which devonshire or surrey or the county i live in or any other county in england can claim reserving always as the sacred right of the mother country the due constitutional dependency of the colonies the inherent supremacy of the state in regulating and protecting the navigation and commerce of all her subjects is necessary for the mutual benefit and preservation of every part to constitute and preserve the prosperous arrangement of the whole empire the sound parts of america of which i have spoken must be sensible of these great truths and of their real interests america is not in that state of desperate and contemptible rebellion which this country has been deluded to believe it is not a wild and lawless banditti who having nothing to lose might hope to snatch something from public convulsions many of their leaders and great men have a great stake in this great contest the gentleman who conducts their armies i am told has an estate of four or five thousand pounds a year and when i consider these things i cannot but lament the inconsiderate violence of our penal acts our declaration of treason and rebellion with all the fatal effects of attainder and confiscation as to the disposition of foreign powers which is asserted to be pacific and friendly let us judge my lords rather by their actions and the nature of things than by interested assertions the uniform assistance supplied to america by france suggests a different conclusion the most important interests of france in aggrandizing and enriching herself with what she most wants supplies of every naval store from america must inspire her with different sentiments the extraordinary preparations of the house of bourbon by land and by sea from dunkirk to the straits equally ready and willing to overwhelm these defenceless islands should rouse us to a sense of their real disposition and our own danger not five thousand troops in england hardly three thousand in ireland what can we oppose to the combined force of our enemies scarcely twenty ships of the line so fully or sufficiently manned that any admiral's reputation would permit him to take the command of the river of lisbon in the possession of our enemies the sea swept by american privateers our channel trade torn to pieces by them in this complicated crisis of danger weakness at home and calamity abroad terrified and insulted by the neighboring powers unable to act in america or acting only to be destroyed where is the man with the forehead to promise or hope for success in such a situation or from perseverance in the measures that have driven us to it who has the forehead to do so where is that man i should be glad to see his face you cannot conciliate america by your present measures you cannot subdue her by your present or by any measures what then can you do you cannot conquer you cannot gain but you can address you can lull the fears and anxieties of the moment into an ignorance of the danger that should produce them but my lords the time demands the language of truth we must not now apply the flattering unction of servile compliance or blind complacence in a just and necessary war to maintain the rights or honor of my country i would strip the shirt from my back to support it but in such a war as this unjust in its principle impracticable in its means and ruinous in its consequences i would not contribute a single effort nor a single shilling i do not call for vengeance on the heads of those who have been guilty i only recommend to them to make their retreat let them walk off and let them make haste or they may be assured that speedy and condign punishment will overtake them my lords 
I have submitted to you with the freedom and truth which I think my duty, my sentiments, on your present awful situation. I have laid before you the ruin of your power, the disgrace of your reputation, the pollution of your discipline, the contamination of your morals, the complication of calamities, foreign and domestic, that overwhelm your sinking country. Your dearest interests, your own liberties, the Constitution itself totters to the foundation. All this disgraceful danger, this multitude of misery, is the monstrous offspring of this unnatural war. We have been deceived and deluded too long. Let us now stop short. This is the crisis, the only crisis of time and situation to give us a possibility of escape from the fatal effects of our delusions. But if, in an obstinate and infatuated perseverance and folly, we slavishly echo the peremptory words this day presented to us, nothing can save this devoted country from complete and final ruin. We madly rush into multiplied miseries and confusion worse confounded. Is it possible, can it be believed, that ministers are yet blind to this impending destruction? I did hope that instead of this false and empty vanity, this overweening pride engendering high conceits and presumptuous imaginations, ministers would have humbled themselves in their errors, would have confessed and retracted them, and by an active though a late repentance have endeavored to redeem them. But, my lords, since they had neither sagacity to foresee, nor justice nor humanity to shun these oppressive calamities, since not even severe experience can make them feel, nor the imminent ruin of their country awaken them from their stupefaction, the guardian care of Parliament must interpose. I shall therefore, my lords, propose to you an amendment of the address to His Majesty, to be inserted immediately after the two first paragraphs of congratulations on the birth of a princess, to recommend an immediate cessation of hostilities and the commencement of a treaty to restore peace and liberty to america strength and happiness to england security and permanent prosperity to both countries this my lords is yet in our power and let not the wisdom and justice of your lordships neglect the happy and perhaps the only opportunity by the establishment of irrevocable law founded on mutual rights and ascertained by treaty these glorious enjoyments may be firmly perpetuated. And let me repeat to your lordships that the strong bias of America, at least of the wise and sounder parts of it, naturally inclines to this happy and constitutional reconnection with you. Notwithstanding the temporary intrigues with France, we may still be assured of their ancient and confirmed partiality to us. America and France cannot be congenial. There is something decisive and confirmed in the honest American that will not assimilate to the futility and levity of Frenchmen. My lords, to encourage and confirm that innate inclination to this country, founded on every principle of affection, as well as consideration of interest, to restore that favorable disposition into a permanent and powerful reunion with this country, to revive the mutual strength of the empire, Again, to all the House of Bourbon, instead of meanly truckling as our present calamities compel us, to every insult of French caprice and Spanish punctilio, to re-establish our commerce, to reassert our rights and our honor, to confirm our interests and renew our glories forever, a consummation most devoutly to be endeavored, and which, I trust, may yet arise from reconciliation with America. I have the honor of submitting to you the following amendment which I move to be inserted after the first two paragraphs of the address, and that this House does most humbly advise and supplicate His Majesty to be pleased to cause the most speedy and effectual measures to be taken for restoring peace in America, and that no time may be lost in proposing an immediate opening of a treaty for the final settlement of the tranquillity of these invaluable provinces by a removal of the unhappy causes of this ruinous civil war and by a just and adequate security against the return of the like calamities in times to come. And this house desire to offer the most dutiful assurances to His Majesty, that they will, in due time, cheerfully cooperate with the magnanimity and tender goodness of His Majesty for the preservation of His people, by such explicit and most solemn declarations and provisions of fundamental and irrevocable laws, as may be judged necessary for the ascertaining and fixing forever the respective rights of Great Britain and her colonies. At this point Lord Suffolk undertook to defend the employment of Indians in the war, 
contending that the measure was allowable on principle, for it was perfectly justifiable to use all the means that God and nature put into our hands. Chatham then rose, and said, I am astonished, shocked to hear such principles confessed, to hear them avowed in this house or in this country, principles equally unconstitutional, inhuman, and unchristian. My lords, I did not intend to have encroached again upon your attention, but I cannot repress my indignation. I feel myself impelled by every duty. My lords, we are called upon as members of this house, as men, as Christian men, to protest against such notions standing near the throne, polluting the air of majesty that God and nature put into our hands. I know not what ideas that Lord may entertain of God and nature, but I know that such abominable principles are equally abhorrent to religion and humanities. What? To attribute the sacred sanction of God and nature to the massacres of the Indian scalping knife, to the cannibal savage torturing, murdering, roasting, and eating, literally, my lords, eating the mangled victims of his barbarous battles. Such horrible notions shock every precept of religion, divine or natural, and every generous feeling of humanity. And, my lords, they shock every sentiment of honor. They shock me as a lover of honorable war and a detester of murderous barbarity. These abominable principles and this more abominable avowal of them demand the most decisive indignation. I call upon that right reverend bench, those holy ministers of the gospel and pious pastors of our church. I conjure them to join in the holy work and vindicate the religion of their God. I appeal to the wisdom and the law of this learned bench to defend and support the justice of their country. I call upon the bishops to interpose the unsullied sanctity of their lawn, upon the learned judges to interpose the purity of their ermine, to save us from this pollution. I call upon the honor of your lordships to reverence the dignity of your ancestors and to maintain your own. I call upon the spirit and humanity of my country to vindicate the national character. I invoke the genius of the Constitution. From the tapestry that adorns these walls, the immortal ancestor of this noble lord frowns with indignation at the disgrace of his country. Footnote. Lord Howard of Effingham, Lord High Admiral of England, commanded the fleet that overthrew the Spanish Armada in 1588. The tapestries to which Chatham refers representing this battle were burned in the fire that destroyed the House of Lords in 1834. In footnote. In vain he led your victorious spleets against the boasted Armada of Spain. In vain he defended and established the honor, the liberties, the religion, the Protestant religion of this country, against the arbitrary cruelties of popery and the Inquisition, if these more than popish cruelties and inquisitorial practices are let loose among us to turn forth into our settlements among our ancient connections, friends, and relations, the merciless cannibal thirsting for the blood of man, woman, and child, to send forth the infidel savage against whom? Against your Protestant brethren to lay waste their country, to desolate their dwellings, and extirpate their race and name with these horrible hell-hounds of savage war. Hell-hounds, I say, of savage war. Spain armed herself with bloodhounds to extirpate the wretched natives of America, and we improve on the inhuman example of Spanish cruelty. We turn loose these savage hell-hounds against our brethren and countrymen in America, of the same language, laws, liberties, and religion, endeared to us by every tie that should sanctify humanity. My lords, this awful subject, so important to our honor, our constitution and our religion, demands the most solemn and effectual inquiry. And I again call upon your lordships and the united powers of the state to examine it thoroughly and decisively, and to stamp upon it an indelible stigma of the public abhorrence. And again I implore those holy prelates of our religion to do away these iniquities from among us. Let them perform a lustration. Let them purify this house and this country from this sin. My lords, I am old and weak, and at present unable to say more. But my feelings and indignation were too strong to have said less. I could not have slept this night in my bed, nor reposed my head on my pillow without giving this vent to my eternal abhorrence of such preposterous 
and enormous principles. End of section 25. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 26 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On the Right to Tax America, by William Murray, Earl of Mansfield. Footnote. Delivered in the British House of Lords in reply to Lord Camden, February 3, 1766, or two weeks after Chatham had spoken on the same subject. Born in 1705, died in 1793. Solicitor General in 1742-1754. to 1754. Attorney General in 1754-1756. to 1756. Chief Justice of the King's Bench in 1756-1788. to 1788 prominent in the cabinet after 1756. 1766. I shall speak to the question strictly as a matter of right, for it is a proposition in its nature so perfectly distinct from the expediency of the tax that it must necessarily be taken separate if there is any true logic in the world. But of the expediency or inexpediency I will say nothing. It will be time enough to speak upon that subject when it comes to be a question. I shall also speak to the distinctions which have been taken, without any real difference, as to the nature of the tax. And I shall point out, lastly, the necessity there will be of exerting the force of the superior authority of government, if opposed by the subordinate part of it. I am extremely sorry that the question has ever become necessary to be agitated, and that there should be a decision upon it. No one in this house will live long enough to see an end put to the mischief which will be the result of the doctrine which has been inculcated. But the arrow is shot, and the wound already given. I shall certainly avoid personal reflections. No one has had more cast upon him than myself. But I never was biased by any consideration of applause from without in the discharge of my public duty. And in giving my sentiments according to what I thought law, I have relied upon my own consciousness. It is with great pleasure I have heard the noble lord who moved the resolution express himself in so manly and sensible a way, when he recommended a dispassionate debate, while at the same time he urged the necessity of the House coming to such a resolution with great dignity and propriety of argument. I shall endeavor to clear away from the question all that mass of dissertation and learning displayed in arguments which have been fetched from speculative men who have written upon the subject of government or from ancient records, as being little to the purpose, I shall insist that these records are no proofs of our present Constitution. A noble lord has taken up his argument from the settlement of the Constitution at the Revolution. Footnote. The Revolution of 1688 which dethroned James the Second, and bestowed the crown upon William of Orange and Mary. End footnote. I shall take up my argument from the Constitution as it now is. The constitution of this country has been always in a moving state, either gaining or losing something, and with respect to the modes of taxation when we get beyond the reign of Edward I or of King John, we are all in doubt and obscurity. The history of those times is full of uncertainties. In regard to the writs upon record, they were issued some of them according to law, and some not according to law, and such, that is, of the latter kind were those concerning ship money, to call assemblies to tax themselves, or to compel benevolences. Other taxes were ranged from escutage, fees for night service, and by other means arising out of the feudal system. Benevolences are contrary to law, and it is well known how people resisted the demands of the crown in the case of ship money and were persecuted by the court. And if any set of men were to meet now to lend the king money, it would be contrary to law and a breach of the rights of Parliament. I shall now answer the noble lord particularly upon the cases he has quoted. With respect to the marches of Wales, who were the borderers, privileged for assisting the king in his war against the Welsh in the mountains, their enjoying this privilege of taxing themselves was but of a short duration, and during the life of Edward I, till the Prince of Wales came to be the king and then they were annexed to the crown and became subject to taxes like the rest of the dominions of England. 
and from thence came the custom, though unnecessary, of naming Wales and the town of Monmouth in all proclamations and in acts of Parliament. Henry the Eighth was the first who issued writs for it to return two members to Parliament. The Crown exercised this right ad libitum, from whence arises the inequality of representation in our Constitution at this day. Henry the Eighth issued a writ to Calais to send one Burgess to Parliament. One of the counties Palatine, I think he said Durham, was taxed fifty years to subsidies before it sent members to Parliament. The clergy were at no time unrepresented in Parliament. When they taxed themselves it was done with the concurrence and consent of Parliament, who permitted them to tax themselves upon their petition, the convocation sitting at the same time with the Parliament. They had, too, their representatives always sitting in this house, bishops and abbots, and in the other house they were at no time without a right of voting singly for the election of members. So that the argument fetched from the case of the clergy is not an argument of any force, because they were at no time unrepresented here. The reasoning about the colonies of Great Britain, drawn from the colonies of antiquity, is a mere useless display of learning. For the colonies of the Tyrians in Africa, and of the Greeks in Asia, were totally different from our system. No nation before ourselves formed any regular system of colonization but the Romans, and their system was a military one, and of garrisons placed in the principal towns of the conquered provinces. The states of Holland were not colonies of Spain. They were states dependent upon the house of Austria and a feudal dependence. Nothing could be more different from our colonies than that flock of men, as they have been called, who came from the north and poured into Europe. These immigrants renounced all laws, all protection, all connection with their mother countries. They chose their leaders and marched under their banners to seek their fortunes, and established new kingdoms upon the ruins of the Roman Empire. But our colonies, on the contrary, immigrated under the sanction of the Crown and Parliament. They were modeled gradually into their present forms respectively by charters, grants, and statutes but they were never separated from the mother country or so emancipated as to become sui juris. There are several sorts of colonies in British America. The charter colonies, the proprietary governments, and the king's colonies. The first colonies were the charter colonies such as the Virginia Company, and these companies had among their directors members of the Privy Council and of both Houses of Parliament. They were under authority of the Privy Council and had agents resident here responsible for their proceedings. So much were they considered as belonging to the crown and not to the king personally, for there is a great difference, though few people attend to it, that when the two houses in the time of Charles I were going to pass a bill concerning the colonies, a message was sent to them by the king that they were the king's colonies, and that the bill was unnecessary, for that the privy council would take order about them, and the bill never had the royal assent. The Commonwealth Parliament, as soon as it was settled, were very early jealous of the colonies separating themselves from them, and passed a resolution or act, and it is a question whether it is not in force now, to declare and establish the authority of England over its colonies. But if there was no express law, or reason founded upon any necessary inference from an express law, yet the usage alone would be sufficient to support that authority for have not the colonies submitted ever since their first establishment to the jurisdiction of the mother country. In all questions of property the appeals from the colonies have been to the Privy Council here, and such causes have been determined not by the law of the colonies, but by the law of England. At present the several forms of their constitution are very various, having been produced, as all governments have been originally, by accident and circumstances. The forms of government in every colony were adopted from time to time according to the size of the colony, and so have been extended again from time to time as the numbers of their inhabitants and their commercial connections outgrew the first model. In some colonies at first there was only a governor assisted by two or three council. Then more were added, afterward courts of justice were erected, then assemblies were created. Some things were done by instructions from the secretaries of state. Other things were done by order of the king and council, and other things by commissions under the great seal. It is observable that in consequence of these establishments from time to time, and of the dependency of these governments upon the supreme legislature at home, the leniency of each government in the colonies has been extreme toward the subject, 
and a great inducement has been created for all people to come and settle in them. But if all those governments which now are independent of each other should become independent of the mother country, I am afraid that the inhabitants of the colonies are very little aware of the consequences. They would feel in that case very soon the hand of power more heavily upon them in their own governments than they have yet done or have ever imagined. The constitutions of the different colonies are thus made up of different principles. They must remain dependent from the necessity of things in their relation to the jurisdiction of the mother country, or they must be totally dismembered from it and form a league of union among themselves against it, which could be effected without great violences. No one ever thought the contrary till the trumpet of sedition was blown. Acts of Parliament have been made, not only without a doubt of their legality, but with universal applause, the great object of which has been ultimately to fix the trade of the colonies so as to center in the bosom of that country from whence they took their original. The Navigation Act shut up their intercourse with foreign countries. Their ports have been made subject to customs and regulations which have cramped and diminished their trade and duties have been laid affecting the very inmost parts of their commerce, and among others that of the post. Yet all these have been submitted to peaceably, and no one ever thought till now of this doctrine that the colonies are not to be taxed, regulated, or bound by Parliament. A few particular merchants were then as now displeased at restrictions which did not permit them to make the greatest possible advantages of their commerce in their own private and peculiar branches. But though these few merchants might think themselves losers in articles which they had no right to gain, as being prejudicial to the general and national system, yet I must observe that the colonies upon the whole were benefited by these laws. For these restrictive laws, founded upon principles of the most solid policy, flung a great weight of naval force into the hands of the mother country, which was to protect its colonies. Without a union with her, the colonies must have been entirely weak and defenseless, but they thus became relatively great, subordinately, and in proportion as the mother country advanced in superiority over the rest of the maritime powers in Europe, to which both mutually contributed, and of which both have reached a benefit equal to the natural and just relation in which they both stand reciprocally, of dependency on one side and protection on the other. There can be no doubt, my lords, but that the inhabitants of the colonies are as much represented in Parliament as the greatest part of the people of England are represented, among nine million of whom there are eight which have no votes in electing members of Parliament. Every objection, therefore, to the dependency of the colonies upon Parliament which arises to it upon the ground of representation goes to the whole present constitution of Great Britain, and I supposed it is not meant to new model that, too. People may form speculative ideas of perfection and indulge their own fancies or those of other men. Every man in this country has his particular notion of liberty, but perfection never did and never can exist in any human institution. To what purpose, then, are arguments drawn from a distinction in which there is no real difference, of a virtual and actual representation? A member of Parliament chosen for any borough represents not only the constituents and inhabitants of that particular place, but he represents the inhabitants of every other borough in Great Britain. He represents the city of London and all the other commons of this land, and the inhabitants of all the colonies and dominions of Great Britain, and is, in duty and conscience, bound to take care of their interests. With respect to what has been said or written upon this subject, I differ from the noble lord who spoke of Mr. Otis and his book with contempt, though he maintained the same doctrine in some points, while in others he carried it farther than Otis himself, who allows everywhere the supremacy of the crown over the colonies. Footnote. James Otis, whose speech, in opposition to writs of assistance, may be found in volume eight of these orations. The book to which Lord Mansfield refers may have been the rights of the colonies asserted and proved published in london in seventeen sixty five or another work by otis vindication of the house of representatives of massachusetts published in seventeen sixty two in footnote no man on such a subject is contemptible otis is a man of consequence among the people there they have chosen him for one of their deputies at the congress and general meeting from the respective governments it was said that the man is mad what then one madman often makes many. Massaniello was mad. Nobody doubts it. Yet for all that he overturned the government of Naples. 
Madness is catching in all popular assemblies and upon all popular matters. The book is full of wildness. I never read it till a few days ago, for I seldom look into such things. I never was actually acquainted with the contents of the Stamp Act till I sent for it on purpose to read it before the debate was expected. I am far from bearing any ill will to the Americans. They are a very good people, and I have long known them. I began life with them. Footnote. Mansfield does not mean by this that he had ever lived in America. End footnote and owe much to them, having been much concerned in the plantation causes before the Privy Council, and so I became a good deal acquainted with American affairs and people. I dare say their heat will soon be over when they come to feel a little the consequences of their opposition to the legislature. Anarchy always cures itself, but the ferment will continue so much the longer while hot-headed men there find that there are persons of weight and character to support and justify them here. I am satisfied, notwithstanding, that time and a wise and steady conduct may prevent those extremities which would be fatal to both. I remember well when it was the violent humor of the times to decry standing armies and garrisons as dangerous and incompatible with the liberty of the subject. Nothing would do but a regular militia. The militia are embodied, they march, and no sooner was the militia law thus put into execution but it was then said to be an intolerable burden upon the subject, and that it would fall, sooner or later, into the hands of the crown. That was the language, and many counties petitioned against it. This may be the case with the colonies. In many places they begin already to feel the effects of their resistance to government. Interest very soon divides mercantile people, and although there may be some mad, enthusiastic, or ill-designing people in the colonies, Yet I am convinced that the greatest bulk who have understanding and property are still well affected to the mother country. You have, my lords, many friends still in the colonies, and take care that you do not, by abdicating your own authority, desert them and yourselves and lose them forever. In all popular tumults the worst men bear the sway at first. Moderate and good men are often silent for fear or modesty, who in good time may declare themselves. Those who have any property to lose are sufficiently alarmed already at the progress of these public violences and violations to which every man's dwelling, person, and property are hourly exposed. Numbers of such valuable men and good subjects are ready and willing to declare themselves for the support of government in due time, if government does not fling away its own authority. My lords, the Parliament of Great Britain has its rights over the colonies, but it may abdicate its rights. But, my lords, I shall make this application of it. You may abdicate your right over the colonies. Take care, my lords, how you do so, for such an act will be irrevocable. Proceed then, my lords, with spirit and firmness, and when you shall have established your authority it will then be a time to show your lenity. The Americans, as I said before, are a very good people, and I wish them exceedingly well. But they are heated and inflamed. The noble lord who spoke before ended with a prayer. I cannot end better than by saying to it, Amen, and in the words of Maurice, Prince of Orange, concerning the Hollanders, God bless this industrious, frugal, and well-meaning, but easily deluded people. End of section 26. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 27 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. On Coercive Measures in America by John Wilkes. Footnote. Delivered in Parliament early in 1775. In October of the previous year, Wilkes had become Lord Mayor and in his official capacity had presented to the king the remonstrances of the livery against the coercive policy towards America, the manner in which he discharged his duty evoking from the king a remark that he charmed him. He had never known so well-bred a Lord Mayor. Elected to Parliament in 1774, Wilkes continued to oppose with vigor the measures of the government in America. End footnote. Born in 1727, died in 1797, entered Parliament in 1757, established the North Britain in 1762, imprisoned for criticizing the King in 1763, expelled from Parliament in 1764, 
outlawed for non-appearance when summoned to trial, returned to England in 1768 and re-elected to Parliament, imprisoned and again expelled from Parliament in 1769, several times re-elected but declared ineligible, elected Alderman of London in 1770, Lord Mayor in 1774, and in the same year elected to Parliament, securing his seat and remaining a member until 1790, 1775. The address to the King upon the disturbances in North America, now reported from the Committee of the Whole House, appears to be unfounded, rash, and sanguinary. It draws the sword unjustly against America. It mentions, sir, the particular province of Massachusetts Bay is in a state of actual rebellion. Footnote. The Boston Tea Party had occurred in December 1773. General Gage became governor of Massachusetts in the following May, and in October the Provincial Congress met in defiance of Gage's orders forbidding it to do so. End footnote. The other provinces are held out to our indignation as aiding and abetting. Arguments have been employed to involve them in all the consequences of an open declared rebellion, and to obtain the fullest orders for our officers and troops to act against them as rebels. Whether their present state is that of rebellion, or of a fit and just resistance to unlawful acts of power, resistance to our attempts to rob them of their property and liberties as they imagine, I shall not declare. This I know. A successful resistance is a revolution, not a rebellion. Rebellion indeed appears on the back of a flying enemy, but revolution flames on the breastplate of the victorious warrior. Who can tell, sir, whether in consequence of this day's violent and mad address to his majesty, the scabbard may not be thrown away by them as well as by us, and, should success attend them, whether in a few years the independent Americans may not celebrate the glorious era of the revolution of 1775, as we do that of 1688. The policy, sir, of this measure I can no more comprehend than I can acknowledge the justice of it. Is your force adequate to the attempt? I am satisfied it is not. Boston, indeed, you may lay in ashes, or it may be made a strong garrison, but the province will be lost to you. Boston will be like Gibraltar. You will hold in the province of Massachusetts Bay, as you do in Spain, a single town, while the whole country remains in the power and possession of the enemy. Where your fleets and armies are stationed, the possession will be secured, while they continue. But all the rest will be lost. In the great scale of empire you will decline, I fear, from the decision of this day, and the Americans will rise to independence, to power, to all the greatness of the most renowned states, for they build on the solid basis of general public liberty. I tremble, sir, at the almost certain consequences of such an address founded in cruelty and injustice, equally contrary to the sound maxims of true policy and the unerring rule of natural right. The Americans will certainly defend their property and their liberties with the spirit which our ancestors exerted, and which I hope we should exert on a like occasion. They will sooner declare themselves independent and risk every consequence of such a contest than submit to the galling yoke which administration is preparing for them. An address of this sanguinary nature cannot fail of driving them to despair. They will see that you are preparing not only to draw the sword, but to burn the scabbard. In the most harsh manner you are declaring them rebels. Every idea of a reconciliation will now vanish. They will pursue the most vigorous course in their own defense. The whole continent of North America will be dismembered from Great Britain, and the wide arch of the raised empire will fail but may the just vengeance of the people overtake the authors of these pernicious counsels. May the loss of the first province of the empire be speedily followed by the loss of the heads of those ministers who have persisted in these wicked, these fatal, these most disastrous measures. End of section 27. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 28 of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Famous Orations, Volume 3. Conquest of America Impossible. By John Wilkes. Footnote. 
The date of this speech is probably November or December 1777, when Lord Chatham had already delivered against the American War the speech entitled On Affairs in America. End footnote. 1777. Sir, it ill becomes the duty and dignity of Parliament to lose itself in such a fulsome, adulatory address to the throne as that now proposed. We ought rather, sir, to approach it with sound and wholesome advice, and even with remonstrances against the ministers who have precipitated the nation into an unjust, ruinous, murderous, and felonious war. I call the war with our brethren in America an unjust and felonious war because the primary cause and confessed origin of it is to attempt to take their money from them without their consent, contrary to the common rights of all mankind, and those great fundamental principles of the English Constitution for which Hampton bled. I assert, sir, that it is a murderous war, because it is an effort to deprive men of their lives for standing up in the defense of their property and their clear rights. Such a war, I fear, sir, will draw down the vengeance of heaven on this devoted kingdom. Sir, is any minister weak enough to flatter himself with the conquest of the Americans? You cannot, with all your allies, with all the mercenary ruffians of the North. You cannot effect so wicked a purpose. The Americans will dispute every inch of territory with you, every narrow pass, every strong defile, every Thermopylae, every Bunker's Hill. More than half the empire is already lost. Footnote. That is, by the overthrow of Burgoyne on October 7, 1777. End footnote. And almost all the rest is in confusion and anarchy. We have appealed to the sword. And what have we gained? Bunker's Hill only. And that with the loss of 1,200 men. Are we to pay as dear for the rest of America? The idea of the conquest of that immense country is as romantic as unjust. The honorable gentleman who moved this address says the Americans have been treated with lenity. Will facts justify the assertion? Was your Boston Port Bill a measure of lenity? Was your Fishery Bill a measure of lenity? Was your bill for taking away the Charter of Massachusetts Bay a measure of lenity, or even of justice? I omit your many other gross provocations and insults by which the brave Americans have been driven to their present state. Sir, I disapprove, not only the evil spirit of this whole address, but likewise the wretched adulation of almost every part of it. My wish and hope, therefore, is that it will be rejected by this house, and that another dutiful yet decent manly address will be presented to His Majesty praying that he would sheathe the sword, prevent the further effusion of the blood of our fellow subjects, and adopt some mode of negotiation with the General Congress in compliance with their repeated petition, thereby restoring peace and harmony to this distracted empire. End of section 28. Recording by Philip Gould. End of the World's Famous Orations, Volume 3, edited by William Jennings Bryan and Francis Whiting Halsey.